So Lindsay, I'm going to kick it off and just do a quick intro of you um, and a little intro of memory facts, and then we are good to dive in. Um, cool. So my name is Celine Krizan, and I am a community marketing manager here at Memory Facts, where we know how important storytelling is and how critical it is to the mission of nonprofits. We are so excited to be having the opportunity to bring you experts in the storytelling field. And today we are fit featuring Lindsay Lachelle. Lindsay is a marketing advocate, a marketing activist is really the way that I love to describe her and the creator of Open Lines Marketing Framework. She advocates for justice, equity, sustainability um, through marketing strategies. And today we're gonna dig into something really critical for all of us leaders in that nonprofit and the marketing space, which is how to get more done. And Lindsay is going to really dive in and I can't wait to learn from her. So Lindsay, I'm gonna hand it back off to you um, and we'll go from there. Cool, thanks Celine. Um, before I start, tell me how much time I have. I wanna make sure I pace this well. You have about 40 minutes. So, and now okay. give us time. At the end of okay. the question. Okay, perfect. Um, okay, I will also go ahead and ask directly uh, if anyone is in any kind of position to take yourself uh, and turn on your camera, I will be very grateful. I don't, hi, yeah, thank you, Nadia. It's lovely to see you. I. Uh, it is incredibly difficult to present to a bunch of people who do not have their cameras on because I get zero feedback. So I would be very grateful if you would turn on your camera. I promise not to call on you. Hello, Joshua, lovely to see you. Um, I promise not to call on you without your permission, um, but please make yourself visible to me. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so excited. I love this content and it's so weird. It's, I, I, I understand that everybody can be this enthusiastic about this topic. So, um, so here we go, ready? Uh, here's what we're gonna talk about. Obviously I'm gonna introduce myself and the reason why we're doing this. Uh, definition of roles is an essential piece of getting this right. And then of course, we've got a process for delegating and delivering. We maybe might talk through some demonstrations if there are some brave folks who want to come off and practice. And then uh, obviously we're gonna do some troubleshooting. So that's the plan. The last thing on that list is what are the first steps that you can take to start to make this a reality in your organization? Okay, so here's the introduction. I do call myself a marketing activist. Thank you for that, Celine. I'm really proud of my work because I figured out a way to make marketing actually a force for good. So I'm proud that my organization is a certified B Corp. We are not just climate neutral, we're climate positive. Uh, I'm a leader of women um, uh, CEOs of B Corps and also a member of the Zebras Unite Co-op. So if, you have curious, if you're curious about any of those, please uh, reach out to me. But why am I the right person to talk about delegation, right? So for a really long time, I've said that it's my spiritual gift to tell people what to do and have them still like me after they've done it. That is a thing I have been practicing in uh, volunteer and uh, employment capacities since I was like 18 years old. So my first job in college was supervising volunteer ushers at uh, the Performing Arts Center. I was a community theater stage manager for a long time. I was an elementary school teacher for five years. I have been a lead organizer for community events, uh, tech, tech events, and uh, I'm also an entrepreneur. So I've been a manager and a boss, employer, a leader, and a consultant. So I have a ton of practice with this. Please trust me, it works. Okay, but let's have a real conversation. Like, why do I care so much about delegation? Why is it a thing that gets me all fired up? It's so boring, right? How someone communicates a request or assigns a task is like, not, it's hard to imagine that it's that important, but it really is. So think about the last time you made a request and the thing that was delivered was not the thing you asked for. It could be like you asked your kids to clean up their room and they didn't. It could be you asked something from your boss, you needed feedback from your boss and you didn't get it. Could be that you assigned something to a volunteer and they didn't complete their task. But like, think about how you felt and then how did you respond? Right? How did it make you feel when you asked for a thing and you didn't get it? And then how did you respond to them and how did that make them feel, right? Did you redo it yourself where they could see you, which probably made them feel unqualified or unimportant? 
did you redo it yourself behind the scenes, right? Which probably made you feel like a martyr, maybe a little angry and definitely isn't gonna make things better next time, right? Did you send it back? Which would be, you know, to have them do it again, which would have them also not be inspiring trust, right? Did you get angry? There's a, there's a lot of ways to handle this, but very few of them are actually effective and build a relationship. Wasting time in these, in these circumstances might be like the least terrible thing that happens, right? There might be a lot of other fallout. Um, and so this is, this is where I really want to pay attention because I consider this purpose-driven work because of the impact of not having it is outsized in purpose-driven organizations right? If you spend less time doing rework, tracking down deliverables, micromanaging, then your organization is stronger. You have more time to sleep or sell. Your impact is greater, right? So it really comes down to managing healthy relationships so that your organization can have every opportunity you want, right? Your relationship gets better. Your kids are more obedient. Your friends and family are better activists. See what I'm promising here? Okay. Are you sold? Are you with me? Cool. Okay. Here we go. In order to make this work, <clears throat> we first have to acknowledge that we are all in this together, that there is a whole system that works a lot better with just a few ideas in place. And we have to be honest, if these things are not part of your culture, then there is some groundwork you have to lay in order to get these new skills, right? They must be broadly culturally supported, especially by leadership. So what are they? First of all, be proactive, not reactive. That means don't wait until it's too late to say something. That means don't make last minute requests uh, the norm, right? Be honest about what you need, what's at stake, what you can and can't do, right? You have to understand that. We're going to focus on being clear. Don't make assumptions about what other people know. Don't take shortcuts in communicating. And then finally, be curious. And this is really important, especially if things go sideways. We can't assume anything. You got to keep an open mind, ask why, and follow up, follow up with curiosity. I am going to mute somebody. Okay. Where's that? Got it. Thanks, Thank Lindsay. You. Okay. So before anything else can happen, we have to get comfortable with this truth, right? No matter if we're talking about a kid or a parent, an employer, an employee, supervisor, volunteer, doesn't matter. You can be peers or not peers. This thing has nothing to do with hierarchy, but it does require that everyone is honest about the specific roles of the conversation. One of you is assigning or requesting the action or task, and one of you is responding to that request. That's, that's just the way the world works. And we try to ignore or avoid the simple fact in order to be nice or in order to not step on toes, everything else breaks down. So I'm giving you permission to adopt those roles in the interest of supporting your organization's mission, right? It's not about ego. It's not about power. It's about setting up effective systems so that we can make the world a better place, like for real. So what are those roles? First, we've got an asker and we've got a doer, right? The asker is responsible for naming the thing what are we asking for? Communicating deadlines, responding to requests. The asker is not doing its job if it ignores follow-up requests from the doer, okay? And then accepting or returning the final deliverables. Those are the jobs of the asker. We're gonna dive into those in a little bit more detail. So what is the doer responsible for? They have to understand the scope, right? They have to understand what comes upstream and what comes downstream from what's being asked right? What are you going to need in order to do it? How will it be delivered? The doer obviously is responsible for committing to deadlines and then also managing their own workload so that the commitments they make can be kept. And then finally, communicating proactively. 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 Oh, sorry. And then obviously delivering the thing, right? Okay. So here's the thing. We've got all these things. Here's really where it's at. If the asker is very good at defining the scope and the doer is very good at proactive communication, either asking questions or, um, or clarification 
or coming back when the deadline is coming up. These things basically handle it all. But like, honestly, in my experience of being, of being a boss and managing volunteers, sometimes proactive communication is like more, it's actually more important than doing the thing well, right? Because it gives you the opportunity to intervene and support and adjust. Okay, so we've got our doer, we've got our asker, we're clear on those roles. Now let's talk about the process, okay? Step one is an ask. Step two, clarification. Three is a commitment. Four is delivery. And five is accept or renegotiate. You can already sort of see how this is going to break down, right? So the asker is responsible for communicating the request to the doer and explicitly naming any expectations they have about the finished product. So it could be a conversation. It could be like using your, your task management tool, right? If you're on Basecamp or Asana or Evernote or any of these other things, it could be requesting a specific delay. Oh, oh, sorry. Requesting a specific delivery date is acceptable, but not required. It's going to come up. It's got to be part of the process, but it doesn't have to be in the beginning stages. Okay. So when you're making the ask, it's super straightforward. What is the thing? What is the deadline? And then context, examples, templates, whatever, as needed to support execution, right? So here's some examples, right? Please sort all these items into piles based on what room in the house they would be used. Imagine like a church rummage sale, right? People will be here for the rummage sale at eight. Is that enough time for you to finish? We've got a deliverable. We've got context for why the deadline is at eight, right? We've got the deadline, super clear. Can you finish that article by end of day Wednesday? Context, I will need the rest of the week for editing and styling the email before we send it Monday morning. Deliverable, deadline, context. Here we go. The client is requesting an SEO audit for their site because traffic has dropped by 70% this month. When can you provide this? Okay, so you see super, super clearly, these are asker scripts. Now, the doer, this is step two now, the doer is responsible for understanding what is being asked of them, right? Since they are the ones who are doing the thing, they are the ones who have to clarify and confirm. So as the asker, you can't make any assumptions about what the doer already knows and can do. But in the end, mind reading is still not a thing. And since the doer is the one making a commitment, the doer is the one that has to clarify and make sure that they understand what's happening, right? They have to do that work. So here is... I, I've, you'll, you'll see the bullet points have changed. I've done this on purpose to make something useful for you. The requirements for clarification on behalf of the doer, right? What's the thing? What are the specifications? What else do I need to know, right? Is it size, shape, number, length, word count, whatever. Do I have all of the access and inputs I need? Logos, passwords, et cetera, right? What are the contingencies? What am I waiting for to come to me until I can start? What needs to happen when I pass it off? What are they expecting? What's gonna happen next with this thing, right? When does it need to be delivered? What is the mechanism for delivery? And then is there a budget, right? Which also to me includes timeline. So I really, so before I move on from this, I want to emphasize a couple of points. So first of all, Checklist. This is a checklist. You can literally just print this out, stick it on the side of your cube, use it as a template to inform to inform asks. If you're ask the same people the same things over and over again, or different set of people the same things over and over again, you can use this as a checklist to make sure you're giving them all the details they need. Right? If you're an asker, this is a rad checklist. If you're a doer, this is a great checklist because it will hold your asker accountable for making sure you get the right information. Right. The other thing I want to say about this is that the method of communication is super important. So if this is something that's like been done many times over and over and over again by the same person, then you don't have to go through this whole thing, right? You can just be like, get me that report at four o'clock on Friday, just like you do every month. No problem. But if the deliverable has a little bit of complexity or it's new to the doer, right? Absolutely. Please, please, please choose for a conversation. Don't rely on Slack, asynchronous, uh, email, project management, et cetera, et cetera. Like those things are not going to help you. Okay. A few examples. We're clarifying the deliverable, right? Sure, I can sort these. 
Should all the clothes go in the same pile? Do I need to separate them by size of garment? Straightforward, right? We are looking at specifications, we're looking at access and inputs, I'm planning for 600 words. Here's delivery method, right? Can I email you the text of the email or of the article or do you want a Google Doc or something else, right? How's it to be delivered? Ack, that sounds urgent. I will report and access to their web, or I need the report and access to their web data before I can start. There's your contingency, right? If I can use the last one as a template, then as soon as I have those things, here's how long it'll take, right? All of this proactive communication around, um, around those checklists. So once we've got it, the doer feels comfortable that they understand everything that's being asked to them. Now they are responsible for documenting their commitment. You can do it verbally if it's a very simple commitment. My recommendation is to keep it in writing as much as possible. But let's be super clear. Yes to what? What are you saying yes to? Like, I love this photo. Is it yes to a wedding? Is it yes to seven kids? Is it yes to moving to Boise? Like, let's be really honest about what, are, what does yes mean? Communicate to the asker all the details that they understand and will commit to. And that then that gives the asker a chance to confirm or clarify. No, just two kids, please. <laughs> so I've got this set up as a cycle because making the commitment really does involve both the asker and the doer. The doer is going to name what's going to be delivered, budget or rules to be followed, when and how they will deliver the work, right? That goes into the asker's email inbox, project management, ear in a conversation, however you do it. And then the asker's job is to say yes or no, here's actually what I need. Here's a little bit more information. Here's, here's a little bit more context or you know, here's closer to this thing. So then it goes back to the doer. The doer clarifies again until we are on the same page. And when we have agreement, that's when we get to move on. So here's some examples. Perfect, right? I'll ask for help if it gets to 7.30 and I don't think I can get it done. I'll share the Google, this is it's clear commitment. I'll share a Google doc with you no later than six on Wednesday, right? We've already got the word count. We already know what it's for. That's been established. Got the passwords, draft audit in your inbox by four. What will be delivered, budget or rules to be followed, when and how they will deliver the work, right? Okay. The next step, delivery, right? So the doer is going to deliver according to the commitment. This can be done verbally, in writing, whatever, but this is really important. If the asker isn't notified of the delivery, it's not delivered. <laughs> I don't know if that's ever happened to you, but like, oh, that report was done three days ago and it was just sitting there, <laughs> right? If the asker isn't notified, it's not done. The doer hasn't finished the thing. So we have to be super clear. The, the uh, asker or the doer then requires deliverables as promised on time with notification. Now, it's the asker's chance to say thank you or ask for something more or different, right? This is it. Thank you, I got it. This is the asker now, last step. Thank you, I got it. Thank you for your work. I have a few updates, questions. I've learned something new. You missed the mark here however you want to address it, right? If it's incomplete, then you got to renegotiate. You go back to step two, double check, check that checklist, do it again, okay? So just a couple of things here, right? First of all, I want to be super clear about this. We're going to take nothing for granted about what the doer knows or is capable of. And that, I really want to say this as a, as a former elementary school teacher, as a stepmom of a young kid, especially with little kids or with volunteers, people who have never been in that context before. Like my six and a half year old, clean your room doesn't mean anything to her. That does not mean anything, right? What does mean something is books on the bookshelf, toys in the toy box, dirty clothes in the laundry. That is a clean your room mandate that she can execute. So, so if it doesn't work, I wanna be, I wanna, I wanna just flag it maybe it's the asker's fault, not the doer's fault, because clarity is super important. Uh, here's another one. Unless your doer has agency over their own schedule, they if they're not empowered to say no, then their yes is also meaningless. 
they need to have the freedom to say no. Otherwise, they're always going to say yes, and we can't know whether or not they mean it, right? They are, if, they're, if your culture involves uh, last minute requests, overwork, like overwhelm, right? If people are not empowered to say, no, I can't add that to my workload this week, then their yes doesn't mean anything either. Be really, really mindful of this. The last thing I want to suggest is if it's a common, repeated, small, mundane request, sometimes all you have to do is buy when, buy when, like no kidding, again, uh, for my partner, it's like, hey, when are you going to take out the recycling? No pressure. I just want to know you set your own deadline. And then, and then uh, it turns out that's a really effective way to get people to engage. And now they're meeting their own promise. They're not, they're not satisfying you. They've made their own commitment. So with employees, volunteers, kids, family members, if it's something they're used to, by when are you going to do this? And then hold them to that, right? Okay. That's it, right? We figured it out. All that thoughtful preparation means from now on, everything's gonna be delivered exactly as specified, always within budget, exactly on time, right? Nothing left to say. Thank you very much. <laughs> Come on, I know, I know it's way more complicated than that. I know people have a lot going on. There's so much more depth to this. So I wanna talk about troubleshooting okay because this is this is a really really important piece of it first of all <clears throat> as you can see this process is one where the real work is in thoughtful preparation right steps one and two actually make or break it so when these are executed intentionally and clearly it can prevent like a myriad of downstream downstream problems but we all know behavior change is hard not everyone loves accountability. So like, here are a few ways that we can like anticipate, identify, clarify. I wanna start with this. Genuinely, one of the best things about this process is that if you do it in writing, right? If you're in a professional context, email, digital project management tools, Trello, whatever, then there's a clear record of what went wrong. And that really sets you up for success when it comes to diagnosing clarifying, preventing it in the future, right? It's a huge, it makes a huge difference. Okay, so most of us go straight to blaming the doer when something goes wrong, right? They effed up, they delivered the wrong thing. They didn't do it right at all on time, etc. right? That's often where we lay the blame. But I wanna suggest it's preparation. This is actually where we see if you fix it here, then the delivery is not the hard part, right? Um, in my experience, the thing, the deadline, the context was not understood far, like well enough in order to get the, the delivery that we wanted. So before we keep going, I have to say this. Troubleshooting makes the assumption that everyone involved is qualified, committed, and behaving with integrity, right? Just gonna start with that. No matter what you may think may have already happened, no matter what experience you have with, with these people, with this person, with some situation, my recommendation is to assume qualified, committed, and behaving with integrity, then let the system reveal whether or not those things are actually there. Right. It might be the structure and the accountability is the thing that provides that like allows for this thing to actually get done. So either way, we just want to be super, super clear about it. OK, so let's talk about it. If the wrong thing shows up, it's incorrect, it's misaligned, it's incomplete, whatever it is. Let's talk about where the asker can do better. Right. You guys are going to see this coming. First of all acknowledge implicit expectations and make them explicit. This is kind of like the, you know, close off the floor conversation with my six-year-old. We got to don't take anything for granted, right? Be real, real straightforward about it. Second, templates, examples, training, support. If they don't get it right, most often it's because they don't know what right looks like. 
So don't take that for granted, show them. And then finally, make sure that there is sufficient context for the task, right? It fits into a bigger picture. You saw that with the, um, with the like, oh, I, I need this draft by Wednesday because it's gotta go, I've got all this other thing that needs to go into it in order for it to get out on Monday, right? We have these deadlines because X, Y, and Z. Sometimes people just don't deliver stuff on time because they don't realize that it's important that it's on time, right? So just giving them that context, you got to clean your room because a housekeeper's coming tomorrow, right? The just a little bit of context really helps support the execution. And that's on the asker, okay? If you're the doer, how can you do better? Spent, just commit to step two. Just print out that checklist, review it, do it. Pay, pay attention to it, refine it, right? Build your collection of templates and resources, whatever it is. Oh, look, already ahead of myself. Support yourself, right? Yes, the asker should support you, but the doer can support you too, or can support themselves. And then there's this other thing of like requesting review, right? If you're worried about not being able to deliver the right thing at the right time, set up a review cycle with the asker and be like, okay, if you need this by Friday, this is the first time I'm doing this thing. How about we look at it together on Tuesday or we look at it together on Thursday so that you'll have a little bit of time to, right? And, and again, as you build trust, as you execute over and over again, you start to see these things get really, um, they, they, they really start to work. You can see how much time you're gonna need to review something, how much space you're gonna need to give someone to uh, iterate, right? Or to, or to uh, incorporate your feedback, whichever side you're on. Okay, now, if it's not showing up at all, or if it's not showing up on time, different set of problems, right? So how can the asker do better here? Plan thoughtfully. Give your people time to do the thing. This actually goes back to the like, if they can't say no, yes, doesn't matter either, right? Make sure they have the time that they need to do it. Give them more context so they understand the contingencies, right? They understand why the deadline is what it is. And then cycle through draft review feedback, right? Again, to make sure that we're on track for the deadline to be delivered. Now, there's a lot for the doer to hear, to do here. And you can tell by where that shows up on the page, right? First and foremost, understanding the deliverable in context. Why is this important? What role does it play, et cetera, et cetera. Make sure as a doer, make sure the doer understands that. Regularly evaluating and calibrating time for, to delivery. Think about how long this thing took you last month, right? Pay attention to that. Plan for it to take that much time or even more, right? Overestimate the level of effort. Um, it's really easy, especially with a new task, to underestimate the level of effort. And so one of the things that I learned as a, in a marketing agency, as a marketing agency owner, if you're doing, uh, if you're doing um, uh, scoping, you know, hourly scoping, you estimate how long you, you think it's going to take based on how long it took with a previous client, if you have that experience, and then you triple it. <laughs> like, actually, that's how we used to manage our budgets. And so overestimating the level of effort is, is, is really, really important to making sure you can do it right. Like the worst thing that happens is you have free time, right? The worst thing that happens is you're not crushed. Speaking up and saying no, this is a really, really, really important one, right? This is cultural. The doer has to have the ability to say no, to say, I've got too much on my plate. If you want me to do this on time, then this other thing has to move, right? That's the negotiation. That's the negotiation. But the doer has to be proactive. And then proactively renegotiate. Don't wait until the deadline was a half an hour ago. Go as soon as you think there might be a problem and say, okay, we, I, need, I need to renegotiate. Either this thing has to move or we need to lower the, the bar for this, whatever it is. Proactive uh, communication and negotiation. So important. Lindsay, can yes. I jump in here? We have a question in Absolutely. the chat. Um, oh, yes. And Naj, Naja, can you come up mute and please correct me if I'm saying your name wrong? Yeah, Naja, uh, thanks. Um, yeah, as I was writing my question for a script, you were putting in the saying no if it interferes with other commitments. Um, and maybe you're going to go into scripts for each of those. I just 
I thought you were running out of room on the slide. So I was like, no, I better ask this question. <laughs> <laughs> the script for saying, yes, I understand that's really important. It has to be done this week. Here's these other things that I have going on. Can you help me? You know, how do I shift those either to somebody else, move it off, cross it off the list, you know, whatever kind of that's right. prioritizing, but you already have that, but I'd love a script. It'd be great. Good. Yeah. I mean, the thing that is really tricky about this in my experience is you really, um, especially if they're, uh, if they're an inexperienced freelancer, right. Then, um, if depending on the nature of your relationship, it might make sense for you to just genuinely coach them on, on task management, right. To really get into the weeds on like, what else do you have this week? Right. How can we prioritize? I, um, you know, I work with a, um, a virtual assistant and we start every week. She sends me a list of like, here's what I think my priorities are right here are, here are how, here's how I'm, what I'm going to deliver. And here's how I think they are important. And so then when something else comes up, I can go to her and say, bump this, bump this, or put this at the bottom of the list or whatever. And it's got some context for, for how important and how rushed it is. Um, but it's also very difficult for a again for a, a inexperienced or young freelancer you're going to find getting them to say no is actually really hard right because they want to they they appreciate the work they need the job and so um so they're going to keep saying yes even to their own detriment sometimes and so having that open honest conversation a, a culture of we are collaborating on this doing it well and on time is more important than you saying yes now right um yeah, that's what I got. Helpful. Cool. Oh yeah, I love that, Cindy. An onboarding tool for sure, for sure. Um, yeah, that's really smart because. And so here's. I'm glad that you that you said that because actually, like the next thing that we're going to talk about is like how to get it into your organization, right? And that is not that's that's not obvious. It's not straightforward. So before we move on from the troubleshooting. I just want to go back to this assumption that everyone is qualified, committed, and behaving with integrity, right? Because unfortunately, we know that's not always true. So whether or not it's true will be revealed in the conversations, the follow-up, and the results of this process, right? No matter what, it's the boss's job. And this is where I'm just going to say, I don't, whatever the boss means in this context, right? It's the boss's job to keep an eye on the patterns consistently communicate about what's working and what's not right and then identify and reward successful execution on the other hand if the doer is consistently missing the mark right despite organizational and leadership adherence to this procedure it will correctly reveal either a lack of ability and training right or a lack of commitment and either way that is the sign that you really need to reconsider whether or not they are the right fit for what they are being asked to perform. I have fired people because of their lack of ability. Like I have fired employees because we use this, we have a written record over and over and over again, nothing gets better. It's time to be honest, this isn't the right fit, right? So I will, I will just put that out there. The thing that I love about it, yes, you get super efficient. You can take for granted that people are going to hit deadlines. You, there's lots of things. If you adopt this as an organization that get really, really good, really quickly. Also, it gets super clear who's on your team and who's not, right? You want to have a conversation about quiet quitting? Here it is. So, uh, so then let's talk about how to get it, right? How do we start doing this thing right now? You believe me now? right? That this thing is effective when it's used, but there's something all else that's really important to think about. And that is how you introduce the system into your organization, right? How you bring it, put it in front of your people and how you maintain and operationalize it will have a huge impact on how it's received. So no kidding. First, first thing, just start practicing a little bit, just start like low stakes, Try, throw by when out there with, you know, a trusted employee or, you know, a longtime volunteer, someone you have a little rapport with, see what happens, see how it goes, right? Uh, I really like a single source of truth when you're talking about in a professional context, right? Find an SSOT 
where your digital record keeping is going to happen. Like, figure it out for yourself, right? What is the mechanism you will use to manage this? Is it Trello? Is it email? Is it something else, right? Is it just Slack records? I don't know. Then introduce it with a small group one person, maybe a small group of up to three people, right? When you're ready, then like introduce it, adopt it. You're going to refine it. This, this small group adoption gives you space to make adjustments in uh, and learn yourself how you're doing it as you're, uh, as you're um, sort of introducing it to everybody else, right? So then once you have the systems, communication, culture, all those things are sort of adjusted, now you can start to introduce it more widely, right? But as you can see, like these are some of these conversations, like I'm a huge believer in, you know, Brene Brown, clear as kind. That's let's let's be honest about this. The more details, the more honestly you can provide here, that is going to be great for your organization, but not all organizations have the culture that can support that right off the bat. So you've got to work up to it. That's cool. Like no problem. There's one last thing I got to say though. Okay. There's one essential piece of adopting this thing that absolutely cannot be negotiated. You cannot try to implement this on the people around you and not hold yourself accountable to the same standard. You absolutely must model this, no matter what role you're in, asker, doer, leader, employee, volunteer, I don't care. If this is your idea and you think it's going to make the world a better place, you must be the one to shepherd it, to manage it, to lead it, right? If you are introducing the system, you have to abide by it and keep it holy because it will not, it just won't go if you, if you don't do that, right? So that's why my advice is practice it first, friends and family, low stakes, right? Small group at work. And then once you figured it out, once you feel confident in it, then you can scale it right? Then once you get some organizational buy-in, then you can work out the kinks, like work out the kinks and do the thing. Okay. Okay. That's it. I really, I can't wait to hear your questions, uh, specifics, generalities, whatever you guys got. Lindsay, what is the hardest part about getting started that you would say, like when you, when you see this, especially in nonprofits, what is the mm -hmm. hardest part? Uh, I mean, people don't like to be held accountable if they haven't been in the past. Uh, that's just true. And so, um, and especially, I'm sorry to do this. I don't know how many of you are EDs on the call, but especially EDs that are used to a culture of last minute requests or overwhelm on behalf of their team. Um, and so, like I, there's a lot, I feel like there's a little feedback in the Slack, but, or in the chat, but like um, my experience is that, uh, you know, being able to say no is just not available to a lot of people. And so that's the, that's the first step is making sure you have a culture that respects everybody's workloads, that respects everybody's skill set and capacity. Um, it can be reversed the other way, right? You can get to those things by, by adopting this this approach, um, but there has to be some movement in that direction. Otherwise, this thing just won't fly. Uh, go ahead, Marcia. Hmm. Question, sort of follow up with that. Um, I work for a small community foundation, and um, um, we work with a lot of you know volunteers, including our board and all those kinds of things, right? And so, mm -hmm. I think um, I think one of the questions that I would have is in the same way that an organization can experience mission creep, a mm -hmm. lot of people who are in nonprofits experience, you know, job uh, scope creep, responsibility creep, right? And it's yeah, like for you sure. raise your hand for one thing and say, oh yeah, I'm really into that. And then all of a sudden it's part of your job, but the expectations haven't shifted. The um, Your job description hasn't changed. Your performance goals haven't necessarily um, haven't necessarily changed. So I would love if you have sort of a way of, oh, maybe a, an additional follow on is, oh, this is the second time I've, you know, I've taken this on. Is this going to mm -hmm. become a regular part of my job? What else kind of needs to change or shift or, you know, what are the expectations in terms of hours, compensation, yeah. 
uh, is this a is this a role change? Is this a title change? Like it's sort of how do you how do you frame all that? I know that's a kind of a bigger thing, but I, it I, is it's something that happens, right? And you you want to give somebody the opportunity to um, take on new challenges and to you know get motivated about the next yeah. exciting thing. But again, it's how do you how do you sort of balance that? So I love some yeah, thoughts. that's a really really good question. So if you are a leader in that context, then I would introduce it intentionally with like, hey, this is a new thing. I'm looking for somebody who thinks they might want to explore this as a new direction in their work. If it goes that way, then we'll absolutely talk about what does that mean for your compensation or your workload or whatever. Um, I mean, when I was, when I had employees, I you know, hired very young people or very uh, inexperienced people and trained them up. And that was really essential to the model that I was working because, I mean, first of all, I love to teach. And so mentoring young people was an important part of my job. But also it's because it, we had that space. I could be like, oh, this client needs something new. We have never done this before. Who wants to jump in and learn? Who wants to see if that's a new part of their job? And then we would adjust their workload and say, okay, so we're going to do the short term. Let's see how it goes. And then that is how my employees grew into the expertise that they then carried on with them into their careers. And so, so as a leader, you got to acknowledge that. If your leadership does not acknowledge it, but you are somebody that is like, oh, that is an interesting opportunity. I want to pursue it. Then it's on you to be proactive about that communication and say, I'm going to, I'm going to volunteer to do it this time but I'm not volunteering to do it forever, <laughs> right? I, I Whatever go that is. Grab the dog, one second. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. And so that's- And Lindsay, like, yeah. we have in the chat, it says important that you prefaced it as a leader. Mm -hmm. So how do you do this if you're maybe not in that leadership role? Can you, can yeah. you give that alternate perspective? Yeah, I think that is, that's the place where you say, um, you know, the, if a leader just says, hey, I need somebody to do this or comes to you and stands next to you at your desk and says, hey, I need you to do this. You got to advocate for yourself, right? And say, I, I am very curious about this new, pro new program. I am happy to get involved. I can't commit to it forever because it's not part of my job description. So let's, let's make a plan for how I might adopt it, support this short term, et cetera, et cetera and then see how that's going to evolve, right? Just ask, is this a short-term commitment I'm making or a long-term commitment, right? Is this just, just ask simple questions. I, I mean, I have to say as a, as a leader who like worked really hard to build a, a supportive and ethical employment culture, asking, um, like allowing your employees to advocate for themselves, giving them the culture, giving them the space to say, I want this. I don't want this. Uh, I can handle this. I can't handle this. Right. Like all that kind of stuff is so important, but also if they don't advocate for themselves, if you are an employee and stuff's getting put on your plate and you don't raise your hand and be like, this stops working for me. Right. That's how we get these toxic burnout nonprofit cultures. That's how we get those organizations. It's just grind people. Um, and so, so it's a two way street and open and honest conversation. I mean, as a, as an employer, I always loved it when people would come to me and tell me what they wanted, right? I can't help you if you don't tell me. And so that, so, and again, that's cultural. Not everybody has that, but um, I still advocate for yourself is the answer. Lindsay, I think that is a beautiful place to end it um, because we as nonprofit leaders, we advocate for our communities. We advocate, we want to make a change, um, but also we need to make sure that we're thoughtful of our needs and where we're going and what we need to do. So thank yeah. you for being so generous um, with your time, with your expertise and sharing with us. Um, Absolutely. And I'm just going to wrap us up again. Um, Celine Krizan, community ma manager here at Memory Fox, and getting to bring people like Lindsay to our community and to all of you is one of my favorite things that I get to do in my job. Um, and it brings me a lot of joy. So I hope you take a lot of way from this session and you're able to really implement it to make things even easier, better, and broader for yourself. And as a reminder, um, I'm dropping a link in there. If you're not a part of the Memory Fox community just yet, make sure you set up a demo with our team because we are helping you simplify your storytelling. We work with nonprofits all day, every day. Um, 
and you will get to meet a member of our team who can help you collect community generated content. And we're integrated with Canva. I have to do that um, commercial here because it's just so freaking exciting to see. Um, and thank you, Lindsay, again, for your time and your generosity. Absolutely. Good luck out there, everybody. Keep in touch. Have a great Wednesday, everybody. Thanks for joining us.